Hey, what's up, Z Pack? It's your boy, Dr. Z, Z Dog MD. If you're nasty, this is the Z Dog MD show. All right, today's guest is legendary. Um, Sam Shem is his pen name. Stephen, Dr. Stephen Bergman is his given name. And he is the author of a book that everybody who's gone through medical school, residency, nursing school has probably read. It's called The House of God. And he has a sequel called Man's Fourth Best Hospital. We've had him on the show before on an audio only, but now in the middle of this COVID crisis where we're seeing frontline healthcare professionals at odds with their leaders and administrators, this new book that he's written is so prescient. It is so on point about the struggle and the need for true revolutionary change that uh, Shem was kind enough to come on back on the show. Shem, welcome, brother. Let's just cut to the chase. Thank you, brother. Dude, it's so good to see you. I love that you, this is a carriage house that you bought in like 1980 with like the proceeds from the movie money from House of God, right? Right, right. I got I got lucky because I got they made the movie. I got the movie money in the house and they never released the movie. (laughs) (laughs) So the worst movie in the world. Really? Some some movies are. Yeah, they spent it was United Artists. They spent 10 million dollars back in 1980 and they made the worst movie ever made. And uh, luckily, it's never been seen. I mean, (laughs) some people have seen it, but I don't know where it is. I don't even have it. I, I, you know. Some movies are so bad that they're funny. No. <laughs> it's that bad. It's just, oh, it's terrible. It's yeah. gone past the curve of where the valley of humor that it's that bad into just no, this is atrocious. That that that's that's actually tremendous. And I love the fact that your roof has signs of water damage behind you. That makes it that much more authentic. Like, is this where you write from? Yeah. Yeah. This is wow. this is me. This is me right here. That's for beautiful. 40 years. Tremendous, man. And I forgot to mention to the fans that you are a professor of medical humanities at NYU, correct? Right. And, right. and I'm happy. Me, someone who doesn't play well with uh, others, me, who doesn't like great institutions. I, I did not flourish at Harvard for many years. And I got to NYU and boom, it's terrific. Okay, let, let's get into that because to me, this is so important because yesterday I did a live rant where I was talking about how I don't play well in large organizations either. That's why you and I have this kind of like kindred spirit thing going on. You're like the successful, smart, and funny version of me. So what ends up... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, Keep trying. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when you said I don't play well in organizations, I'm like, yeah, I feel you, man. But so here's the thing. You just said you actually really are happy now at NYU. So tell me what is it in this organization that's actually different or that you find connects you as opposed to what was happening previously? Yeah. Um, it, this is the most important thing that's happened to me in the last, you know, six years in that, um, I got a call out of the blue. Uh, I wasn't in medicine anymore. Um, I was just writing. And a guy said, uh, the, the vice president or something, doctor says, hey, how'd you like to be a uh, professor of medicine at NYU? And I said, well, why? Why would I do that? You know, I'm happy. <laughs> and he said, well, we want you to teach. And so what do you want me to teach? And he said, I want you to teach the house of God. And uh, it just floored me because Harvard hated me in the House of God. <laughs> I bet. They did very nasty things to me on the House of God and my reputation. Really? So and they came after here, you? Oh, yeah. They, they, it was nasty. Yeah. It was nasty. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I didn't care. Yeah. I don't, I don't uh, you know, I don't do fear. I do guilt. <laughs> are you Jewish? Yes, you are. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. <laughs> I've got a Buddhist practice now. Oh, you know? got it. Yeah. Um, but um, the, 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 so I, I said yes. And uh, for the first time, the first, and, and when I got there, I uh, sort of looked around, you know, and I, I saw that the, uh, the uh, people were really kind of happy there. And they liked working with each other. I'd spend a night in the Bellevue, you know, Bellevue, 900 people never turn anybody away. Um, and I spent a night in the emergency room there. And in the middle of the night, this guy emptying the trash is not surly. He's kind of talking to people, this and that and the other thing. You know, it's really not. And I said, where did this tone come from? 
And as you know, tones in big institutions come from the top. And it's a big hierarchical structure. It's, it's 47,000 people, NYU. Turns out, I find out, the top three people are all refugees from the house of God. <laughs> <laughs> the actual hospital, the house of God, Beth Israel. The, uh, the, uh, it, it comes down from the top. Yeah. They were abused in the house of God and they were not going to abuse other people. They, they stopped the, the circle of abuse. Isn't that something? And, and then here's, yeah, go ahead. No, no. And these are clinical people. These are trained physicians, et cetera. They're, yeah, they yeah. were they're doctors. The, the head guy, uh, Bob Grossman, was a surgeon at the Beth Israel when I was doing my internship. He's a, he's a genius, what he's done to that uh, organization. And you can see it during, you saw it during Sandy, the tornado that came in, Hurricane. And now you're seeing it with, with uh, Bellevue and also the, the other part of NYU in the uh, uh, epidemic. Mm-hmm. You know, they're amazing. Uh, tomorrow, actually, they asked me to do an E- grand rounds with the all the er people from bellevue so i'm looking forward to that so so let me ask a question so this idea of leadership coming from the top in other words setting the tone what you saw was was a kind of a we're in this together a kind of us and we thing can you can you tell me more about that because you're talking to students and, and residents tomorrow you're doing e grand rounds what i mean how are you going to tie this in together because people right now are so frustrated dude like they are furious at administrations around the country for this dis- disconnect this lack of communication this feeling hey we trusted you with one thing which is keep us safe support us that's why we we have you and and you failed, and now you're trying to silence us, and and so on. So, so love your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's that's the question of the of the time, actually. Um, all all I can say is that the thing that I and you have uh, realized in life and in medicine is the most important thing is a good connection. Mm. And they got, when I got there, I thought I saw they valued not the you know elbowing people out of the way and rising, not competition, not self. They they totally valued connection. Now they didn't know. I'm putting it into my my words, and I came in and taught them more about um, uh, how to talk about this. The word connection instead of self. What it is at at uh, NYU is that. People are helping. It's this. It's ser- it's, it's service, not uh, you know climbing the ladder for your own success. It's a real, real. Somehow, it's a tri- it's a real shift to the we. That's what it is. It's a shift to the we. And now um, there is a lot. This is a big st- uh, thing, but th- there's a lot of uh, anger now that's bubbling up all over New York, for instance, because we're not the the people are not being. Uh, 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 supported in all the ways that we know. Um, and actually, I, through a Buddhist group, just two days ago, was asked if I could help distribute um, free face masks, surgical face masks, to hospitals because they have, but they, they raised all this money to get Chinese face masks to. Uh, to send wherever. So I last the last day or two, I've been contacting hospitals to see if they want them. And the funny thing was, you know, and I got and I did a lot of them. A lot of them are getting these face masks. Uh, NYU didn't want them. They've got them. Mm. Now that's amazing. They've got them. Bellevue and you know and everybody. They've got. They've sort of got enough for now. It's hell, but um, they. They know they haven't forgotten where they came from, these guys. And uh, there is just this sense, you've been in it sometimes, where you get a sense they care for you and they're listening to you. And uh, they have every week a whole, uh, you know, a whole E thing with all of the different, you know, 15 hospitals and departments all on at once. And it's terrific. However, what we're seeing in a lot of other hospitals is, you know, you don't care about us. Uh, you know, there's, there's starting to be resistance protests, you know, people with, with placards and stuff. But I want to get back to the thing about 
NYU where I really got lucky. I, I you know, I turned 75 last year and I just am so great, grateful for how my life has gone. I mean, it could have gone one way or the other a number of times, either by death or not or whatever. Or, and I'm just happy as a clam. And I got real lucky going back to man's fourth. Uh, because I got this job at NYU and I'd been out of medicine for forever. And uh, I'd always wanted to write a sequel to The House of God, but I wasn't in medicine. I couldn't do it. And the first time I went on rounds at NYU in one of the hospitals, uh, I saw all the miracles, you know, the miracles of the miracles. But I also saw two things that are really you've seen very closely too and have written and talked about in a wonderful way. I saw... That what medicine had come to was money and screens, which means money and money. Yeah. And what the narrator of the of Man's Fourth Best says, uh, Roy G. Bash, he says it was a time I, I'm called to write this novel, he said, sequel to The House of God, because it was a time when medicine could go one of either one or two ways, either toward uh, more humane care or toward money and screens, which means money. And money and the book, as you know, uh, it's about three months now that it's been out or something. The book uh, is about um, when the man's bet. It used to be man's best hospital in the rankings. You know these stupid rankings from U.S. News and World Report. But it started to go down. It's a big wasp hospital, and it went down from one all the way to four. And actually, it turns out in the book that the Beth, that the house of God was one above it, which <laughs> is the Jewish hospital versus the Wasp hospital. So anyway, uh, so they're in real trouble, as as the Wasp board said in the book, says in the book, as a guy on the board says, uh, you know, one of one of these Wasps got a little nervous and one even got depressed, you know. Imagine that. <laughs> so anyway, they call up, who else? The fat man, who they know. Uh, who has made it big in Silicon Valley, uh, creating uh, a drug in, in, that uh, is going to restore memory in Gomers and others. Mm. And he's made a fortune already. And, uh, and we want you because you've got fame and money, prestige and money. That's what we need now, more of. So they bring him in. What do you want to do? And this was Z. The fat man, who is mostly me, actually says, OK, I want to have a public clinic clinic um, that's up against your hospital, your big hospital. And I want to show in this clinic how to put the human back in medicine. And so that's his goal. And he rounds up the guys. He might dust Eddie and, and Chuck and Hyper Hooper and, all those, and new people, too. A lot of women. But and and uh, he. He. Um, he go he goes at it. I mean, he has he has he's going to try to see if he could do this, and that's why I love this book and wrote this book because I wanted to see if I could do it. You know, I took on abuse of of interns in the House of God. This time, I'm taking on the whole healthcare industry, as you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I tell you, it. The more I saw, the more I got. I, I was on fire. I was really on fire on this book. You know, I, I think it may be my last long book because it's like, you know, but that's what it's addressing. And, and you know, it covers everything that we're facing now. Right so, down to the strike, you know. So, 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 Shem, like uh, when I read the book, I remember just thinking, yeah, 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 just underlining, yeah, that, uh huh, yeah, 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 yeah. And what you said is exactly right. With if, if if House of God was about intern abuse, this is about all of us being abused, and that includes patients, and that includes even the administrators, right? Like you said, they're in this, they only are as good as their incentives, and we've turned medicine from a calling into a business, we've reduced all of us into commodities, and you know, something you said early on here when you're talking about the culture at NYU, now again, I'm gonna bet you, Shem, that in the comments, we're gonna see people from NYU who are working on the front line saying, no, this is wrong, we're miserable, we don't have PPE, all of that, and you'll see that no matter what. Um, just because ev everybody in an organization has different experiences, and one thing you said about this, and I saw it in Man's Fourth Best, because Man's Fourth, everybody puts onto a book 
their own experience. Like you said, the fat man is kind of you mixed with X and Y and Z. For me, when I saw that book, when I saw the clinic that they built, that was the ideal clinic, medical people working together in teams turned off the EHR for writing, but only accepted information from it. So they hacked it so that they only got what they needed. So the money component was taken out. The idea that they, the hospital needed it for good PR, so they couldn't like shut it down. And they did everything right. They spent time with patients. They empowered their staff. They focused on actual quality of life instead of just doing things to people. They focused on diet, nutrition, and prevention, and spirituality, and the, 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 the base core of humanity that we are. And I saw in that my own attempt at doing that and how it was crushed by the financial forces of health 2.0 that we're living in now, and it was very affecting. And another, and again, and I, I'm sorry to go on this tirade, but just give me one more minute. <laughs> when, <laughs> So so the other thing that the book reminded me of and you just reminded me of right now is the idea that when we lead in a group, we want to nudge everybody up to the us and we level where there's a a core value mission that we're all in it together to support each other instead of the different levels that that you could be at. So that level, and there's a book called Tribal Leadership where Haley Fisher Wright, who's a physician, wrote this book. She was on my show with Dave Logan, who's a business guy, they collaborated and said, there are five levels in an organization of culture, and the goal of any leader is to lead this tribe to higher levels. Level one is like a prison culture. Life sucks, and it's just stab or be stabbed. Level two is only slightly above that, and that's where many nurses and frontline healthcare professionals are, and that is my life sucks, but the boss's life is really good. So we're going to slog through and try to get to the next level because, boy, they look like they're making a lot of money, but I'm suffering and have no support, right? Level three is where many doctors are, which is I'm great and you're not. So it's all about self and competition and trying to, and especially in academics, it's like, well, elbowing each other out, but it's about me, 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 and dominating everyone underneath and trying to get to the next level. But the next level, Shem, is where you're in your book. That's where that clinic starts, which is level four, which is we're great and they're not, which is we're gonna do something together against these other people that are doing it wrong, and then we might transcend into level five, which is life is great. We are competing yeah. against nothing but what has ever existed, and all of us together are working together. So a, a leader's goal is to nudge people to those higher levels, and when I read your book, I said, Shem is a leader. He is nudging us to a higher level. People should read this book, whether or not they think, oh, they don't, you know, they don't like the style or they don't like the this or, you know, whatever complaints people have about literature, forget about that and just go, this is how healthcare could be if we abandon everything that isn't that, right? So that's my rant. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Uh, well, I liked your rant from yesterday. It was even better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Then, then let's burn it all down it was, to the ground. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. Really. It was brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, what 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 I came up with doing is, you know, they it, it's this he's got really he's got an optimal. The fat man has an optimal system to try to create this thing. And you're right. One of the things when I was writing, this is fiction, of course, they were getting killed by the, you know, by the billing, right? And the machines. That's what kills you, the billing, not the data, the billing. Data's good. Data's great. Um, and then suddenly they're getting more and more depressed in this little clinic because they're spending so much time billing. And all of a sudden, boom, they still get incoming. <laughs> They can't do outcoming. They still get all the data, but they they can't bill. So my writerly side, this is you know fiction. I wish it would happen, but my writerly side said, "Well, how in the world are they gonna are they gonna um, how are, how are they gonna order tests and stuff, mm. right?" And so the fat man organizes runners for health. Some high school kids. <laughs> you know, I remember in the old days in hospitals, yeah. people would go around Orders. and carry the slips to them. Yeah. So the, the runners for health 
And actually, there are some med students who join the Runners for Health who are high school kids because they want to get into medical school and all this stuff. So they solve it. I mean, and then, of course, everybody goes crazy in IT. They can't find out. They've never seen this before, that only that only you only get in going and outgoing doesn't work. How is that possible? And the hours and hours are going to, they're going to go drill through the walls of the hospital. And see, you know, and it's all, you know, it's not by chance. Of course, you find out that some fats has somehow arranged that. Yes. There's a, and also the other thing is, which is, this is key to the book. I mean, everyone, you know, when you get this kind of idea, it's lovely. It's so much fun. It's uh, that, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I lost my, my thought a little bit about, uh, the fat man. Um, oh, I know. Um, the money that the clinic makes is based on patient satisfaction indexes, right? That's right. This is true. In many, yeah. the PATS app. Yep, yep. PATS that's true. App. That's what, mm-hmm. Isn't that true? Age I mean, caps. You know, Press gain yeah. These are the other terms. Yeah. But these are called the, the PATS apps, the patient's satisfaction. And lo and behold, what happens to this new renegade clinic? The pat sets go way up because there's lots of time to face with and talk and do what doctors do, you know? And so all of a sudden, they're the star of man's fourth best hospital, you know? And that's, that it kind of goes on like that, which is fun. It was was beautifully done, Shem. and, And it was, again, it really highlighted, first of all, everything that's wrong by showing them how it could be done right. Whether it's practical or not, you go like, okay, can you get high school students to like go run orders instead of having to enter them, right? Yeah, okay, that's great, that's a hack. But the truth is, well, what's the fundamental problem? That we're entering, we're data entry clerks, we're billing clerks, we're not doctors anymore. So what happens when you make us doctors again and nurses again and respiratory therapists again and dietitians again? Oh, we actually love what we do. We reconnect with the passion of that. It's about us and we again. It's about a good team. So you focus a lot about the team. Even your evil administrator in that piece, you have a lot of, there's compassion for him. And uh, I won't say how it all ends, but you have compassion that this guy is holding allegiances to multiple masters that he can't balance. And that's how our leaders are now because of the screwy incentives that we have, right? When it's become a business and you know you pay a billion dollars to get, uh, your, your EHR is called buddies, I think, right? No, heal, heal. Oh yeah, the, the, right. The HAR is called Heal, H E A L. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So Heal, the you're... overarching conglomerate that owns and, con- and crushes Man's Force, is called Buddies. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound anything like any existing groups in the Boston area, but some people, yeah. some people have said it's it sounded like partners. That's what you know, I thought. This huge. Yeah. No, I didn't say it. it was, you know, this huge thirty-seven billion dollar Buddies. You know. <laughs> And um, the uh, and and it and partners actually at one point recently they were in some financial trouble or something. This huge, biggest employer in Massachusetts, they own the Harvard hospitals and everything else. And uh, and all of a sudden we got a somebody sent me. You know, I'm on the. They sent everybody sends me things around here, and all of a sudden it says partners is going to rebrand itself. They're going to change the name because they're in so much trouble. <laughs> uh, people uh, were were asked, doctors were asked, did you have suggestions for the name? And apparently a lot of them wrote in buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the funny part. Uh, yeah. The not so funny part is it, they are spending $100 million just to change the name. You oh. think this isn't crazy? $100 million. Think how much PPE you could buy. Shem with a hundred million dollars. But this is this is the problem. So so you, I consider you as one of our brothers in arms on the front lines of fighting the absurdities of medicine. Another person who's doing that is Marty McCary, who's a Hopkins surgeon who's written a book called The Price We Pay, and it's about the money games that we have to play in medicine. And this is one of them. When you're constantly fighting with insurance companies for nickels, when you're constantly dealing with parasitic middlemen like these pharmacy benefit managers, the Optum RXs, you know that United spins up all these big, huge conglomerates. It business 
business it businessifies things so that you have a whole class of people that are working that are adding no value that have to justify their own jobs and you can't blame them because it's their job right but the system then founders under the weight of this unnecessary bureaucracy. So, you know, at that point, what you're doing is you're feeding the machine all the time. And a hundred million dollars to change a name sounds about right as part of that. And think, think of all the, think of all the preventative care you could provide through a type of clinic like man's best, a fourth best hospital spun up with the fat man for a hundred million dollars, right? Oh yeah, you could run it for 10 years. Or 10 years. 10 years and well, um, you you've, uh, you you came to that in Las Vegas in your in your what you founded exactly eventually. and and our partners actually are based in Boston Iora Health they're still doing clinics under that model but they're focusing on Medicare Advantage and the idea is it's a team based model so you have primary care physicians nurse practitioners etc with health coaches these are like your young volunteers who are hired for their empathy and their connection and then they're trained to do things like motivational interviewing get into the heart and the soul of the patients do the heavy blocking and tackling of developing relationships and care plans and then the doctor gets to practice that high level intuitive medicine that only we can do because we've been trained for 10,000 hours to do it right and it's a team so everybody leads the huddle at some point everybody learns from each other teaches from each other everybody supports each other in service of the patient but also in service of each other i saw that in your book and we had never spoken prior to your book yeah, and you yeah. independently i mean so the idea is if all paths lead to this it means we're probably on to something that that could work yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I, I'll go back to, I'll turn into my writer a little bit more, but um, I write, uh, what gets me going is when I see an injustice, mm. right? And I write in resistance to injustices. That's what I do. I came out of the 60s, of course. Yeah. And, um, and that really, that really gets me going. And the thing I write about and talk about uh, is uh, how to stay human in medicine, the danger of isolation and the healing power of good connection. And good connection is mutual connection, the we, as we talk, as we talk about. And I, um, I realized that I also have these, what I call, hey, wait a second moments, like when you're doing something and you're like, even on the street, you pass a guy or and, and he's asking for a dollar in the old days, you know, and, and you don't give it to him. You Hey, wait a second. Why did I not give him that? He looked OK. When all when it all gets like in the house of God, it all got so, hey, wait, so many wait, hey, wait a second moments. Somebody's got to write this. It's got to be me. And it's a mission. What can I tell you? I'm nuts. So when I understood what was going on in American healthcare, because I was back right in the center of it, um, I uh, said, hey, wait a second. Somebody's got to write this. And the thing, you know, looking back now, it's three months out. Or, well, it's almost probably a year since I finished. I look back over it. And what I realized is, uh, well, it rides on humor. I hope you agree with that, you know, like the House of God does. I mean, you talk about serious stuff. you got to have it rise on, ride on humor. I was always going to read it. So, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absurdity is my middle name, too. Yeah. <laughs> but. What I've realized, you know, and some people have told me, they, they've said to me, um, you know, this is your James Joyce book, or this is uh, a masterpiece, you know, various different people, or this is a Moby Dick and stuff. And what that means is because I'm older and the narrator's older, he knows, he's, he's I mean, Roy Bash was just, just trying to survive. This narrator, Roy Bash, you know, he's about my age, actually, when he writes it, and he um, he just he just understands a lot more about how this all is being done, not by one person or by one hospital, but this is what we've created. And almost I, 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 I can't believe it when I look at it now, almost everything you want to talk about in modern American healthcare is somehow represented through the characters and the humor. And then, of course, as you know, it gets it gets fairly dark, like the House of God got dark. Yeah. You know, uh, but then in the end, I think there's a but um, so that I, 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 you know, I just got lucky again. And I'm, I'm grateful because I really this is going to sound very pompous. I think like I. 
with the house of God, I put it out there and people said, aren't you scared about this? And aren't you how people are going to react and all this stuff? And I said, all I did was tell the truth with a little sex and a little humor, a lot of sex and a little humor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Anybody says anything about this book? You know, it's all I did was tell the truth. And I, I as you know, I hit on most of the stuff, like even, you know, that, that that scene that you want with the radiologist just, you know, cowering in the basement, not having any contact with people, but going through the mm. anyway. Mm. And of course, it also talks about the major thing that's been going on, which is this burnout that you've talked about and I've t- t- talked about, which I don't like so much. I think it's just abuse. Moral but injury. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If somebody wants to, you know, I feel, uh, you know, I feel just so really like I did it, whatever I did, you know, and I, and you're one of the people that validated it first and it made, you know, really, really appreciate it. Uh, man, uh, you know, what you said, see, see, this is a thing, speaking truth these days. Actually, this is a good theme for this whole pod. I'm trying to think of the title of this thing. And Speaking truth, speaking truth when it will risk your job or your reputation or your sanity, whatever it is, is so important and yet so underdone. The only reason, honestly, Shem, I have any success, look, I'm not a handsome guy, I'm not even particularly funny, I'm only marginally smart enough to get through medical school, but I will. All, I have a pathology, which is if I see something, I just say it. I go, well, you know what's happening here is this. And we need, I think, more people that are smarter than me, like yourself, who are actually speaking that truth, who are crafting that truth, who are putting that truth out in the world. Because in order to fix something, you first have to name it. You first have to understand it. You know, Wendy Dean and Simon Talbot took the idea of burnout and they said, let's name it what it is. It's moral injury. We are being forced to do things that are incomprehensible to who we are. And it's creating this tension because we're serving multiple masters. We're serving the money masters. We're serving the patients. We're serving our families. We're serving ourselves. We're serving the heels at EHR. We're, <laughs> you know, we're serving buddies. And it's driving, it's ripping us apart. What we need is cohesion where we're serving a cause in service of others together, right? And 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 we can do that, but it requires naming the problem, and that means telling the truth. And when you did that with House of God, and you paid the price, and Harvard came after you, and these guys treated you terribly, imagine back then, I can't imagine back then, it was even more hierarchical and awful in terms of the culture. At least some of that has improved, but it's become more of a business. So, you know, kudos, man. I, I We need more Sam Shems. Well, um, I think, I think you're either born with it kind of, or maybe in your early years, I don't know about that stuff, but, uh, I, I really, nothing gets in the way of me telling the truth is the way I feel it. Nothing gets, because I'm talking for those guys that were hurt with me. I'm talking for the guy that was hurt at the BI, like Bob Grossman, and he, he turned it around to become the 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 head of a forty seven thousand dollar fairly kind place, you know, NYU Medical School. Obviously, I just have to say, man's fourth best hospital is not an NYU hospital. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's that's very clear. Mm-hmm. It, I couldn't write about NYU. It's, as I say, I like it too much. But um, yeah, um, I I I think uh, well, I'll tell you what. I was when the House of God came out. I was very idealistic. I'd never written, published anything. I'd written plays and stuff. I'd never published anything. And um, um, I decided that real writers didn't go out and, um, you know, uh, pump their book. You know, that's that's just below me. I just did the book, let it do it, let it go with what it, what it is. I didn't do any, I did no appearances. And because in those days... There was no net and I took a pen name. Nobody could find me except writing a letter to the publisher. And for two years, um, I, uh, and maybe I told you this before, but it was a seminal moment in my life for two years, because I'm kind of a shy person in a way, mm. believe it or not. Um, uh, that's why I sit here for 40 years writing novels. <laughs> <laughs> With a leak but in your roof, yeah. It's, uh, it's anyway, um, They'll have to drag me out of here, you know. Yeah. Uh, 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 let me tell you something about the corona and me. Okay. But um, so for two years, I didn't take, I had 
they, they could get through my publisher. They'd send a letter. For two years, I didn't say anything to any of the invitations. And uh, then I got a letter through the publisher, opened it up, and it said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a doctor on call overnight in a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a VA hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, if it weren't for your book, I'd kill myself. Mm. And I, that's what I did. I said, mm. Mm. I said, oh, it hit me right, right in the heart and the gut. And I just remember the moment. It's like one of these marvelous moments that we get to totally unexpected, you know. And I said, well, I guess people want to hear what you have to say. Mm. And so I started accepting pretty much every invitation that was reasonable that I that I got, you know. And of course, some of these invitations would come in from the students at a, at, at a, a medical school. And I'd say, oh, okay, you know, Buffalo, I think was one of them, a number of them. And uh, then I'd get a letter from the dean saying, oh, no, you know, we've decided to go with someone inside the school this year, you know. Mm-hmm. So they, just like that, older generation, no, hated me. Mm-hmm. Younger generation, I I told them, I spoke their experience, you know, they, you know, you know, I, uh-huh. I, I told it as it is. And uh, the interesting thing about man's fourth best hospital, um, we should talk about this because I, I want it to be very out there, political, a nidus to make something around. Um, I'm even seeing it now, I think, in the people who are really running healthcare. You know, I'm not, you know, there were, there were almost, no reviews of it, you know, uh, unbelievable to me. I mean, the, the blurbs and, and the, what were they're terrific, as you know, but nobody really is reviewing it. And the people I know who are my age kind of uh, at the top are not contacting me, you know, who are higher up in these institutions, not NYU, they love it. But uh, like the great Art Kaplan, you know, uh, the ethicist loves it and David Oshinsky Osh- and others. Um, but I think there is a little bit of a split now, too, because if you're higher up enough in medicine now, you don't feel this way. You know, you don't feel this way. And, um, and, and, uh, that's okay. That's okay. But, you know, it'd be, I want to see everybody else feel that way. And, and we, we have, and I'll just say one thing. With someone who probably does have the corona right now. Yeah, you got to tell me about that because you you had symptoms. Not fun. I don't think it's dangerous. I, I, yeah, yeah, I've had symptoms. So not yeah. not not the bad ones. So Janet and I, uh, uh, you know, I I started. I was I was doing a lot of of uh, appearances for Man's Fourth, which was great. And in uh, February and up until the fourth of March or something, I was doing big crowds at hospitals and and uh, medical schools around the New York area, a lot of it, other places. And uh, I think I got it mm-hmm. then, which is about a month ago, which is good. And then I gave it to Janet and she's doing all right too. But mm-hmm. it was pre- it's pretty terrible stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. You have fevers and everything? I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. okay though. I'm yeah, okay. Yeah. If, 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 I'll tell you, if, if COVID-19 kills Sam Shem, I will lose my shit, Sam. <laughs> 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 That's not okay. So you better stay safe. Well, you know, Janet, of course, you know, Janet's my longtime b- b- Barry, you know. In yeah, the book, in the book, yeah. Both books, you know. Yeah. Barry plays a big part in this book. Yeah. Um, you know, as soon as it got clear that I had symptoms and she had symptoms, the next day she's getting a will. <laughs> you know, we're, we're writing a will. We're going to see the, we got to do it right away. We're not going to be here tomorrow, you know. Oh, I'm saying, oh, oh man. On. Well, it's pragmatic, if nothing. Yeah, but um, I, I digressed about about uh, about this. But what I'm saying, Z, which is what you said so beautifully yesterday in your rant, if it was yesterday, is that you know what, this epidemic is uh, it's terrible, but it's exactly where this has to go before people are going to stand up. And I was watching TV the other night and people, I think they were up maybe at Montefiore or Lincoln Hospital with the, with their placards. And they had incredible things to say, you know, on the placards, you know, uh, I, I don't um, remember the name exactly, but 
now is the you know we got to really get together in the wake of this don't you think this is not this is <laughs> this is the time when actual change can happen this is the time when america can look at its system and go uh yeah no no more and it's got to happen from a groundswell it's got to happen from the people working in the system and like you said there's a deep disconnect between the folks at the top who are the look they're doing their best with the incentives that they have. They're not bad people, right? The problem is when the, you're only as good as your incentives, and if you're getting paid a million plus dollars to continue working a system where you are relevant, you're gonna continue to do that. They're gonna look at a book like Man's Fourth and go, ha, 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 ha. But what's weird, Chem, is like when I go and talk and I talk about Health 3.0 and this connected, re they are on board so they, they they'll say yeah how do we do this the problem is we have to get insurance money the problem is there are these regular the pharma is it? so everybody's got a complaint but the thing is well, no 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 if you really ethically believe in this we can actually do it but it's going to require a crisis of the level of covid which we have now now's our opportunity because people are pissed and when you're pissed you can actually accomplish change you were there in the 60s you saw it happen people organizing together to do this so I think in conjunction with what you've written, in conjunction with, with, with our movement, in conjunction with what bright spots are emerging around the country, this is the time. And you know, all, politi all politics is local, all healthcare is local. There are different ways to solve this problem in different areas. So we have to give people the autonomy and the flexibility, we have to change the incentives, and we have to support physicians and nurses. And you know, this, now's the time we might have actual real tort reform. Now's the time we might actually Look at our EHR and go. Was was this then an obstruction? You know. You yeah, know. Um, that's that's uh, absolutely right. Um, the as I said, I felt I had to really take on what healthcare is. Funny in you know humor and tragedy, et cetera, in this book. And at one point, this is the hardest thing I had to write in the book. Was I said I got it. I said. Jim, you got to figure out what healthcare is now. And at the at the in the middle of the book, the fat man, he likes even though he's a high tech guy, he likes a blackboard and chalk. So in chalk, he gives a chalk talk on the six rackets in American healthcare: colon follow the money. And then the second thing is at how to resist it, what to do about it. And that comes later. I can talk a little bit about that. I don't want to spoil it all, but it's no secret. But, um, and Z, for, for me to write that, you know, it's probably about four pages or something, this lecture that he gives. And it's funny, you know, and all this stuff. And it works. I, I, I have to, I, I don't, I don't just get out there and yell. I, I, I try to make it funny. I think it works. But I spent a month or two trying to figure out how these six things all came together. I talked to a lot of doctors, read a lot, because nobody knows how it all, I mean, it goes all the way from the screens to the, um, to the hedge managers. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that, it's, it's that big and, and the buddies and all of that stuff. And um, so the, the issue is very, you know, the issue couldn't be clearer about where we've not stood up. It's yeah. just classic, you know, it's it's classic uh, pe worker thing. I mean, as I say, and it says in the book, I think someplace, uh, when somebody falls down in a crowded theater, does the shout go up? Is there an insurance executive in the house? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's so classic. We're the workers. And so um, the, 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 the issue is really to, as the fat man says, the solution in a general sense, he puts it so well, is to squeeze the money out of the machines. Mm. To squeeze the money out of the machines. Mm. Because they were started with Obama, uh, you know, in 2008, as, um, as data. They, they wanted to codify the data and be able to send it. Mm -hmm. to somebody that's good that's all good and then i wish somebody would write an expose of this and then the private insurance industry got their hands into it and every code had a price it was a cash payment for every code so what do we do about it well 
as the fat man says at the end, it's no big secret. Uh, you know, there, there are the secrets that, do, that I will not reveal about the book. You have to go read it. Everybody's got to read it and tell Absolutely. their mother to read it or whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, what, what we have to do now is to, like the VA, you have a system where it's a it's Medicare for all or whatever you want to call it, a national system. And um, the guy, suppose that somebody's had an appendectomy. Okay, so the surgeon is typing this up. It all went well. You know, it's going to going to build, going to do the data now. So he does the data, and because it's a national healthcare system, it takes him maybe I don't know, hundred clicks or something like that, and he sends it to Medicare, wherever, whatever national system there is. Right, done. And then, because we don't obliterate the supplemental insurance industry right away, that's not going to, that's very hard to do. He says, well, does this guy have private health insurance? He says, oh, yeah, yeah. Z has private health insurance, too. One click. All the data goes to the insurance company, private insurance company. And guess what? We will have negotiated if we're strong enough. We would negotiate that, hey, you want to get paid more? Do it on your computers. Don't touch our computers. So you get the billing out of our computers, except for the national billing, which is there's no dickering with insurance in the VA. There's one price for an appendectomy with some geographical barriers, you know, which is every other national system has. So, you know, they are responsible for getting more money. The insurance company, don't, if, if we had, it's like the VA, talk to them. If we had just data things and, you know, one person to, to send them to, um, we'd be happy campers, wouldn't we? I mean, that would solve so much so much of the things. Administrative complexity is one of the biggest burdens currently. Bureaucracy is the second biggest burden. And it's tricky because it's always a balance. So you have to make sure you fight bureaucratic entanglement along with administrative entanglement and it becomes interesting. The one thing though, no matter what, whether you're a single payer guy, whether you're a, a libertarian, let the market do it guy, whether you're a, a nobody's a current industry guy except for the current industry people. So nobody's saying, hey, let's just keep this. Uh, no matter what, we ought to focus on paying for what actually helps, which is prevention, uh, nutrition, uh, uh, focusing on primary care, and then considering hospitals to be loss leaders. Like if you go to a hospital, it means that we failed somewhere. So we don't profit from hospital care. We just make sure that that cost is factored in, that if we fail to actually keep people healthy from public health, from pri you know uh, private physicians caring for, for patients, then then you pay the price in the hospital side instead of right now where it's like, oh, you didn't keep someone from getting diabetes, we're gonna make more money because they're gonna end up in the hospital getting their foot amputated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, Shem, you know what's interesting? So a lot of people don't talk about this. Guess what the guess who invented these codes and the idea that insurance is the only people you can bill and so on? It was the American Medical Association. And at the, the root of all this, back in the 20s and 30s, was the American Medical Association saying, because you know what happened in those days was physicians said, let's band together and form co-ops, effectively little insurance companies where patients can directly come to us, pay us a flat fee, and we'll take care of them. Kind of like the direct primary care movement now. The AMA squashed it. They didn't want anybody threatening their own hegemony around this. And they said, no, 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 if, okay, if we're gonna do this because it looks like the government's gonna socialize this if we don't act now, let's just only accept third-party insurance part, uh, companies, and they have to be fee-for-service. So we have to have billing codes, which means we're gonna bill for widgets, which means we're gonna do more widgets to people because that's how we get paid, because our now the incentive. And decades later, the AMA has no voice now. They're, they don't speak for anyone, and we're all voiceless, and it's all a, a big business machine. And so it's interesting to look at the history because then you can go, well, what are we gonna do to get out of it? It's gonna require a revolution. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and you and I have had conversations about this before. Um, we're looking at what could be a wonderful national alliance of doctors mm -hmm. who are, what, am I, what did my wife say on our walk today? I just, she put it so well. She said, I should write this as an op-ed. Uh, yeah, 
sort of what do we doctors do after this? Ah. What do we do after this? And if not now, when? Um, and then she said, um, well, that's basically it. But it's, it's uh, oh, she said, do you want to go back? Do you want to go back to, uh, you know, doing what we're doing before? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, as a, she put it a nice way. But OK, doctors, nurses who we've had long conversations about this, they're terrific in getting what they want. They have a union. Yeah. You know, they really can, they really know how to get together. They're in, women are valued for connection and individuality. Men are mostly valued for, in, are, are valued for individuality. And we wrote a whole book about that, Janet and me, called We Have to Talk, mm. Healing Dialogues Between Women and Men. But, um, okay, doctors, nurses, and others. Uh, and then, um, uh, patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, patients want it too. And then, you know, I would not throw hospitals out of this mix. Mm -hmm. I really would not. I wouldn't Because either. they're not, they're, they're, they're twisted into, you know, knots trying to deal with the insurance industry. So I put them depending, especially if they're doctor run, these big institutions, they're better. But, and, and you know, you got to get rid of the buddies. I mean, you got, you know. Somebody asked me in, uh, in, I was giving a lecture in one of the buddies, one of the, uh, partners hospitals in a little in, Freudian slip there, Shem. Yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in one of the, one of the hospitals, I was giving a talk on man's fourth uh, a couple of months ago. Somebody said, well, what do you think? What do you think you know, we ought to do about partners? And, um, I didn't really answer the question, <laughs> but the question is for all these big organizations, kill them. Yeah. They don't serve a function. They do. They serve no function. Hold, hold, hold on, Shem. I'll tell you the function they serve. They serve the function to en masse negotiate with insurance companies. Yes. That That's their sole function. Good. Well, yeah. when, when Partners was founded, actually, I looked back, they said that their goal was to increase the cost of care. <laughs> it's right there. It was in the Boston Globe. Increase uh, the cost of care. Right, right. Uh, anyway, the, but I'm saying, you know, hospitals are, are, you know, what do hospitals hate the most? They hate dealing with insurance companies this way. In the book, which is based on fact, in, in, in Man's Fourth Best Hospital, there is a billing building, yeah. which has 350, you know, billers there. And they're sort of, they're, they, they have a a cappella crew called the billables, you know, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, um, so, well, so much said that that the what's really what, what we're getting ripe for now is certainly nurses and doctors. You see nurses and doctors and others who work in healthcare out there on the streets in Harlem, you know, in that thing yesterday. Um, and patients uh, are, are going crazy with what uh, this this time now is uh, a profound time in all different ways. And I, I really am an optimist. I think that things are changing. I really am. And uh, it, it's not going to go on like this. It can't, the, the, the other thing I was going to say is, and I say it in the book, that the patient, our work, our patients are not just our patients. Our patients are the climate. Our patients are the world. Our patience is what, where does the water come from and where does the garbage go? You know, this in some funny way maybe didn't create the pandemic, but the, the public health response to the epidemic is, you know, these are all potential real pushes to get us off our, our asses. And, you know, I don't know how to, I, I can't be in the, in the, I can't do this myself right now. Nobody can. But I think there are a lot of people who are just really fed up with this. I think we may see a sea change. You know? I think you're 100% right. And I think that, uh, you know, as we approach an hour here and I run out of recording space, I think this is a, no, no, I was going to say this is like the perfect segue to a call to action, which is telling people, do not let a good crisis go to waste. Would you like to go back to how it was? Would you like to... Um, Never forget how this was, because this sort of money-drenched industry run by suits has failed us when 
the rubber hits the road, when we really need to, to act, it's failed us. So let's build it right, and we can do that. And there's a different ways to skin it, but we can absolutely do it. And it's gonna re- require us, to require people who actually take care of patients along with patients. I love the idea of forming a national union with doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals together, National Healthcare Workers United, something like that, right? Because that's 12 million people, yeah, okay? And I'll tell you, like, because doctors love to fight with each other. They, it's like herding cats. Nurses kind of know how to do it together, but really they're only focused on their narrow interest, right? But what if we all focused on our common interest and we pushed back? That would be the end of the system. It would be the end of it. You could even get the administrators in and go, hey, okay, what are the parts of the jobs you hate? All right, let's try to figure out how we can do this together. And I bet we could. So that's my hope. Um, and my hope is also, ZPAC, that you check out Shem's book because it's freaking awesome. It will get you all pissed off, especially right now if you're home on lockdown. My other hope is that you uh, and Janet, uh, Shem, stay safe if you're having symptoms. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Because, Thank you. yeah, yeah, that's just, you know, you know, you, you, you look and sound good, but, you know, Boris Johnson in, in Great Britain just got admitted to the ICU and uh, it's it's a tough disease, man. What we're seeing on the front lines. Yeah. You know how I you know how I think of this now. Mm. This is a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been told that before by people who do not have coronavirus that I may just be a, a good a good one. I like this it's one. A good, oh, I'm glad like you're enjoying. It. That's good. I'm nice psychotic with a great guy. Even better, man. We can share our febrile dream delusion of healthcare transformation together. Maybe one day it'll actually happen. We'll make it better. Look. Um, I really, really appreciate, you know, when you write a book and it goes out, you never really, you know, people don't talk about it that much with you. And all the way along, really, right from the very beginning, you have been uh, very, very uh, encouraging about this book. And and I I hope we can continue this however it happens, because we're brothers now in this. Oh. Shem, I would, I'd be so honored, and I've been honored from the beginning to even be in your presence. You're a legend. You're a revolutionary. You care about your fellow human beings and their connection, and that's why it's so great to have you back on. Thanks for spending an hour with us. Guys out there, do me a favor. Share the video. Leave your comments. Tell us your stories. Tell us what you're going to do to overthrow buddies and heal and make man's fourth best hospital man's first at actually caring for all of us together. All right, guys, I love you. Think about that National Healthcare Workers Union. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, good. Uh, I think we're on to something there, Shem, you and me. Let's lead it. And then you know what? Then it'll devolve into a cult of personality where you and I are like the dictators. I'm going to start wearing a little <laughs> red suit. It's going to be awesome. No, uh, I think uh, I'm too shy and you're too sensible. <laughs> Those are that's something I've never been accused of. Certainly not by my wife. Oh man! All right, Shem. You were you were just born in the same in the in the wrong time. You know, in the sixties, you would have been. Oh, dude, man! I I'm frightened to think about it. I probably never would have gotten past the doing a lot of acid phase. To be honest. Uh, hey, oh, quick question: Did you did you ever dabble in psychedelics, Shem? Uh, no, I didn't. I I uh, I uh, did uh, enough alcohol to float oh, some. Yeah. Yeah. Some uh, some ships and I uh, I really uh, it's really interesting, you know. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a little medical trick. When I just said alcohol, I licked my lips. Ah. And I treated alcohols alcoholics and addicts for many many years as a psychiatrist, and that's the that's the Shem sign that when they first mention alcohol, if they're alcoholics. They do something around their lips. Oh, Isn't that wow. interesting? And I just did it. So anyway, no, alcohol was my drug. And yeah. that was about it. Yeah. Uh, well, and, you know, as I said, uh, let me end with, you know, I am the most grateful person in the world right now. I'm, I'm full of gratitude at this time. And when I look back, you know, I shouldn't be here. I mean, you know, things could have happened that I was gone. And I'm grateful. I, for one, am grateful that you're still here as well, Shem, and that you've uh, you've been able to connect with me in the way you have. It's been lovely. Yes. Yeah, been really lovely. All right, Zipak, count all your blessings in this difficult time. Stay safe, and we out. Peace. <laughs>